Hello, I'm Michael Brown, president of the School for Advanced Research in Santa Fe. I'm speaking to you from the El Delirio campus of SAR on Santa Fe's east side. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to the first Creative Thought Forum event of 2022 as part of our series, Seeking Justice Toward a More Equitable America. The series explores themes of social justice examined from multiple perspectives. Today's event is titled Justice, Public Lands and Indigenous Peoples. Over a century after the establishment of our national parks, questions about the scope of parks and other public lands, their management and the heritage of the original indigenous inhabitants have become the focus of debate. In this webinar, two historians and an indigenous writer discuss how public lands may figure in efforts to undo past injustice. The series is made possible by a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Please note that any views, findings, conclusions, or recommendations expressed in this webinar do not necessarily represent those of the National Endowment for the Humanities. Additional support is gratefully acknowledged. This includes support from Patricia G. Foshi for the Stuart Hall Charitable Fund, the Pella Hema Foundation, Thornburg Investment Management, the Luke and Betty Vortman Endowment Fund, the Flora Crichton Lecture Fund, and members of SAR's Founder Society. All of our public program is made possible through the generous support of donors and members. If you'd like more information on becoming an SAR member, please visit our website at sarsf.org. We also welcome voluntary donations for this event in particular. Today's event will be moderated by CJ Alvarez, who will introduce our two presenters. CJ is an associate professor in the Department of Mexican American and Latina, Latino Studies at the University of Texas, Austin, where he writes and teaches about the history of the US-Mexico border and environmental history. He's the author of the book, Border Land, Border Water, a history of construction on the US-Mexico divide published in 2019. And his articles have appeared in journals such as the Western Historical Quarterly and Environment, Space and Place. During the 2019-2020 academic year, his work was supported by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation here at the School for Advanced Research. Before I hand off to CJ, a brief comment on format. We expect the webinar to last 60 to 70 minutes. During the last 20 minutes or so, panelists will respond to questions from the audience. Please put your questions in the Zoom's, uh, in Zoom's Q and A panel, rather than the chat panel where we might not see them. We'll do our best to respond to as many questions as time allows. Finally, SAR members and other, in, other people who might be interested in continuing the conversation after the webinar are invited to an informal post-webinar Zoom discussion beginning at 3.30 Mountain Time, so roughly 15 to 20 minutes after the event ends. If you aren't already enrolled, <clears throat> please contact Amy Schiffer at SAR, that's Schiffer at SARSF.org. The event will be limited to 25 participants and CJ Alvarez has generously agreed to join us for that and Patty Limerick may be with us too, which would be a great pleasure. So now I'm pleased to hand off the job to CJ Alvarez. Well, thank you very much, Michael. It's good to be back virtually to, to SAR for this event. It is. We, we are talking to two of the, the highest caliber uh, public intellectuals in the United States today. And I, I, it's hard for me to imagine uh, two better folks to, to discuss this topic of justice, public lands, um, and indigeneity. Uh, first, we have David Troyer, who is Ojibwe from the Leech Lake Reservation in Northern Minnesota. Although he's a professor of English uh, at USC as well, so he splits his time between California and, uh, and Minnesota. He is a writer of both fiction and nonfiction. He's won all kinds of prizes, including the Pushcart Prize. He's gotten fellowships from the NEH and the Guggenheim, and of course, from SAR, where he wrote uh, his book, or in part wrote his book, The Heartbeat of Wounded Knee, which was a finalist for the National Book Award. He's published essays and stories in Washington Post, um, New York Times, and many other places including most recently The Atlantic, um, which is which many of you have probably already read. And that's the, the basis of the discussion that we'll be having today. 
this, uh, this article he wrote last May called um, Return the National Parks to the Tribes. And then we have Patty Limerick, who for people in the, in the American West hardly needs any introduction. She's from Banning originally. She wrote, uh, she's a professor and has been for, for, uh, for quite some time at the University of um, Colorado Boulder, where she co-founded back in 1986, the Center of the American West, which is one of the, the most extraordinary institutions. Uh, I was gonna say of its kind, but there really isn't anything of its kind aside from the, um, aside from the center. And it is truly unique in so far as it tries to bridge the gap between academics and the general public. And the, the, the motto of the center is turning hindsight into foresight. And so that's one of the things we're gonna to try to do today over the course of our discussion is see what, what we can learn from history and how to move forward in a more just world. She is also the author of Legacy of Conquest among many, many other things and the recipient of a MacArthur Fellowship. Um, and, also, my one of my favorite pieces of writing that uh, that she has done uh, was her first very first book uh, called Desert Passages. So um, so hopefully we can get a chance to talk about a little bit about deserts today in the context of, of the broader conversation about national parks. So there's a lot more to learn from from both of these presenters and a lot about what they've accomplished. And so you can look them up and you can find um, endless uh, endless material. That uh, that you can learn if you're if you like what you hear today. There's a lot more where that came from. So without further ado, I want to turn it over to David to set up the the conversation about um, about the national parks and the and the tribes. Thank you, CJ, and um, thank you, Michael. It's a pleasure to be back at SAR, um, even though I'm, I'm not physically back and uh, that's disappointing. But, um, you know, COVID being what it is, I'm happy to be back, at least in this capacity. And I'm also really happy to um, share time with Professor Limerick, who is one of my um, heroes and uh, in, 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 <laughs> in uh, someone um, I've always been somewhat in awe of. So it's really, really, it's really exciting. Uh, for me. And so I th what we decided behind closed doors before this webinar began was that we decided that I would sort of kick things off and talk about the piece I had in the Atlantic Monthly last spring uh, called, I think the, the title was, was very on the nose, it said Return the Parks to the Tribes, I think. Um, it's not a very elegant title, but I guess it carries some force. And so I want to talk a little bit about the thinking that went into that piece, um, some of the thinking behind it, and and that's that's going to kick us off. Um, so you know you'll have to indulge me for a few minutes. Um, I also want to thank Michael for referring to the three of us as two historians and an indigenous writer, because, <laughs> because I have I have over the past few years been introduced as a historian so often, and it always makes me a little queasy because I'm in no way qualified um, to be called a historian, I think, in, in any regard. So, um, so I'm, I'm happy that Michael didn't, didn't <laughs> paint me with a historian brush because I don't feel like I'm worthy of it. So, so thanks, thanks, man. And um, so in any event, I would, I'll, I'll bring you through some of the thoughts behind this piece. So the Atlantic Monthly had, was thinking of launching a series of pieces a sort of reconsideration of, of America in conjunction with both the anniversary of the Atlantic Monthly's founding and also like I think the 125th anniversary of something to do with John Muir um, who published widely and, and you know first in the Atlantic. And so I was asked if I wanted to write a piece about the national parks and uh, it was uh, complicated, right? Parks are, for me at least, speaking very personally, complicated spaces. Um, for me, it's I've always been keenly aware of when I'm at Yellowstone, when I'm at Glacier, when I'm at Voyageurs in Minnesota, Minnesota's only national park, and close to where I grew up at Leech Lake, uh, and places like that, that I'm keenly aware of the fact that 
not in all cases, but in most cases, those parks were made at the expense of extant native tribes. So for example, Glacier National Park in Montana was carved out of Blackfeet lands um, at their expense at a time when the Blackfeet were the most disempowered in terms of their political power structure. Um, they'd experienced a number of social collapses as the result of disease and starvation and, and some terrible winters. And so, so traveling to parks in, and knowing that when I'm looking at El Capitan at, at Yosemite, that I'm standing on the site of the massacre of Miwok native people, and that that massacre made the park possible. That when I'm standing in Glacier National Park, I'm standing in a place that was wrested from uh, the Blackfeet Nation. When I'm in Voyageurs National Park, those are our homelands as Ojibwe people through which you know, we should expect to sort of be able to travel, to live in, um, to use as, as we see fit. So, and it's really interesting to me. So as I began researching this piece, he said, I, he's, my editor said, say something big about parks. And I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, I don't know, go big. You know, this is big idea time which is always nice when an editor gives you that kind of latitude because they don't always do that. And um, I thought about it. I did some traveling, I did some talking. And the piece that emerged was a big what if, what if, what if we gave these parks back to the native people from whom they were taken to manage and to protect and to usher into the future on behalf of all park visitors and all, all American people. So what if we do that? Um, how would that look? And, and why should that happen? And I feel really strongly, um, and this is really, I, I think, uh, Professor Limerick's bread and butter. Um, I couldn't help but feel as I traveled around and talked to people that, um, America's in trouble in a lot of ways. And some of our troubles are obvious. I went about researching this piece on national parks and traveled around to all these parks during the height of COVID and during all sorts of social tensions around masking and distancing. And this was before the vaccines were even available. Um, it was the same summer that began with the murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis in my home state. Um, it was clear to me that as I traveled around the, that summer visiting parks and talking to people that this country was in deep trouble. And I feel very strongly that this country has a violence problem. And that violence problem is the problem that undergirds all others. And I feel it in some sort of, in some sort of fungal way, right? That running beneath the surface of this country you know, you have these invisible filaments, you know, of, of violence, which connect everything from George Floyd to masking protests, to school shootings, to, um, you know, the Bundy standoff of a few years ago, to Waco, um, to the way that America practices its own form of capitalism, um, which is a kind of brutal expression of, of that system, that underneath all that connecting all these things is a sort of very buried, very subterranean um, and initial and original violence problem. And so I thought, okay, what's one way that we can, we can begin to undo that socially, collectively, you know? And I thought, what if the parks are returned to native people and that, all the native tribes extant in the United States today as a consortium control all parks and parklands and national monuments, manage them, control them on behalf of all Americans and visitors. And um, not so much as reparations, although reparations was, was one way to, is, is one way to think of that but rather as a kind of ritual gifting to put a more Ojibwe spin on it. Um, 
when you lose something as an Ojibwe person, when you experience some sort of personal loss, a death in the family, there, there are a few remedies that you can exercise, um, culturally speaking. You can put someone through a ceremony, you can adopt, if you lose someone in your family, you can adopt someone from another family, from the offending family, from the family who took your family member, you can adopt one of them. You can also do what's called, what we call in our language, the laying of gifts, where you, or you cover somebody, you physically cover them in gifts to make up for their loss. And I kind of think of this as, as a kind of Ojibwe style ritual gifting. Um, so I wrote the piece, you know, I published the piece and um, I got a lot of responses to the piece, surprisingly, <laughs> surprisingly. Um, some of them were, yeah, great idea. Not, not that many of those though, at least the vocal responses, there weren't many of those. There were lots of, that's a terrible idea. Native people are all drunks. And if you've ever been to a reservation, they're really messy places. Um, there were other responses like you lost, so just deal with it. And I don't really respond to comments, but I did respond to that one. And I said, who ever said that this struggle is over? What makes you think that we've stopped fighting? Um, but if you wanna concede, I happily accept your surrender uh, if, you're, if you're tired. But now they didn't respond to that. I don't, I don't know why, it's very strange. Um, but the dominant response was, um, was, well, this is a very bold idea. It's a very bold idea. I said, it's actually not that bold at all. Um, a bold idea is to steal someone's land, to pretend like you didn't, to mismanage it, and then to sort of call that America's greatest idea. I think that's a bold idea. I think my proposal is a very sensible proposal to help rescue our parks because our parks are, as I see them, are, are kind of in trouble. Um, they are overcrowded, they are overvisited. There's all sorts of environmental impacts from too many visitors, especially at places like Yellowstone um, and other fragile environments, desert environments in particular. Um, the Park Service has not been proceeding with any kind of overall um, plan for climate change and how to sort of how to manage the parks and how to help them into the sort of next few centuries at the very least in relation to climate change. The sort of science wing of the National Park Service is, is atrophied over time. Um, the National Park Service has been rocked with some very um, damaging and complicated personnel problems, sexual harassment and abuse of park workers by superintendents who rule these parks like fiefdoms oftentimes. They have incredible power as superintendents. And so I thought, you know, who better to manage these parks than sovereign nations who have a long history of administering, of working inside bureaucracies and dealing with multiple jurisdictions, of managing widely scattered parcels and so on. And there would be, I thought also a kind of political justice, a kind of reparations because when the process that, when the, the park process began in the 1870s um, and it's still ongoing, they're still making new parks to this day, but roughly, roughly sort of concurrent with the establishment of the first parks and the growth of the park system. Concurrent with that was the loss of native lands after the passage of the Dawes Act. So the first park was made in what, 1874, and that was Yellowstone. The Dawes Act was passed in 1887. The Dawes Act sort of allotted communally held tribal lands and created individual ownership of individual parcels. Excess land was, was opened up to settlement and development. So, since 1874, the parks have put roughly 90 million acres into protection. Since 1887, just because of the passage of the Dawes Act, Native people have lost roughly 88 million acres. It's almost equal. So I say fair trade. <laughs> I say, you yeah, know, let's give these back and we'll take care of them. And I don't think it's a bold idea. I think it's just a rather sensible idea. So that was the thinking. Um, 
and it was it was interesting, right? Because I would pose this to to park rangers, superintendents on my travels. I said, "What if we did this?" And they said, "Oh, I don't know. How would that work?" I said, "I don't know. We've made thirty-seven more states after we made the first thirteen. We have gifted back the the Panama Canal." We have, you know, the British have sort of given back um, Hong Kong, although that's very complicated. I don't know if it's a good analogy um, at this point. Um, there, there are many processes around the world where the administrative and political structures that govern large parts of land have been changed. Um, it's been done over and over and over again. It's not new. It's quite old. And there are lots of processes that, that we could employ to make this happen. I think it's, it's not that hard. So anyway, that was the thinking, um, bold or not. And so I think I should conclude here and, and um, bring in Patty, because she's incredible. Well, thank you. Um, what a really extraordinary piece of luck to be here today. And DJ, big fan there and big fan of David Troy. And I just feel I'm and late in life. I became kind of an exercise nut, which I was not. I was a couch potato for about part of 30 years. But any moment in David Troyer's company is like a level of cognitive exercise. <laughs> you just think this is intense. And maybe this is elliptical or whatever it is. Maybe I should lower the resistance here because I am really I'm sweating here. It's really intense. So as an exercise nut, I just think now my head is doing that now. My, my mind is being pulled around in ways that are really great. And uh, thank you so much for, for that. And if I'm, if I'm aging with some degree of mental fitness, I think I owe some percentage of that to you because I just have always thought, really? Okay, I can take that in. So let me think more. So, okay, what an honor to be here uh, under this, with this company. And I am going to say a few things that are just important historical contexts. And... I will begin with what I have spoken, maybe some people in the audience have heard me say this, that the public lands originated at the low point of American race relations. It is the nadir of nation, it is the nadir in every sector. It is the time of Jim Crow segregation, the progressive era, the late 19th, early 20th century. It is the, certainly the nadir of Indian population and Indian sovereignty. It's the plenary power of Congress's power to simply overrule anything that any people might have wanted. It is the period of, of uh, exploited immigrant labor, uh, Mexican or Asian, with no protections and so on. And I mean, it's just, it's a low point. I don't know how these things exactly are to be calibrated, but I don't see how you can calibrate it in any other way. So that's the progressive era. And many wonderful and interesting reforms of uh, efforts at workplace improvement and uh, Pure Food and Drug Act and so on. There's aspects of it that are quite, quite extraordinary, but often really aimed at uh, supporting and protecting white middle-class people. So that doesn't change things too much. So the public lands, originated in an era when race relations was at its absolute low point. And I'm not in any way saying, but I'm saying, and the public lands are an extraordinary heritage. They are probably one of the, it's hard to, for me to think of what would be an equal gift from the past to the present. And I appreciate that I'm swallowing here. Uh, because, of course, Theodore Roosevelt on race was uh, repellent. And Theodore Roosevelt did speak often and acted often with the notion that people in the present have an obligation to people in the future, that we are not able to say, posterity, who cares? So, okay, so I like... I guess I've had to like it because what am I going to do about it? That I like having to confront over and over and over again that the public lands originated in a very grim period of American history, and we are very fortunate to have that legacy. Because there were when we say, oh, there was John Muir, and then there was Gifford Pinchot, the first head of the Forest Service, and those are the two poles. No, way on the far side of Gifford Pinchot were people with with 
a great desire to exploit and extract and leave a mess behind them. And we, when we leave those people out, that's not helping us to do the preservationist conservation thing. So, so I think it is a great, great cognitive exercise. I'm going to say that here too. Uh, not always as enjoyable as a David Troyer inspired cognitive exercise, but still a good one. And I don't know that there is anything more important for Americans to be doing if they want to deal with their own contemporary problems than to look at that kind of that situation, which is omnipresent of a very mixed heritage of a heritage that makes our, our skin crawl and a heritage that makes us say, thank heavens, same originators. And is that comfortable? Not in the least. Is it necessary to deal with that? Yes. Uh, so the twin sins, we often hear that phrase, the twin sins of the origins of the United States, slavery and conquest. Maybe I'm wrong about this, but it sure seems like really, really fast the conquest part fades away or becomes something we'll deal with some other time. And the, the slavery part is front and center. And I am not in any way diminishing the importance of African-American people and the uh, tragedies and miseries and cruelties of their treatment, but it doesn't seem like we can do both of those at once. It seems like there's something that is just, now we're going to have to pick a polarity and we'll pick the white black polarity, but we can't be doing that in something else. Well, we can't, we're certainly cognitively capable of of that. Uh, so that is the great challenge that David has really given us a very concrete, very down to earth, very material thing to say of, can we really do the reckoning with the, there I say the legacy of conquest, not in a way that obscures or pushes to the margin the legacy of slavery, but really does that as well. So this seems like a really great chance to, this is where my optimism, that's not optimism, it's just like, We'll be better for it if we take if we say, "Oh, this is very disturbing to us. It's, it worries us. It saddens us." Well, yeah, of course it worries us. It saddens us. Uh, fine, deal with it. And we can't. I, I totally believe that we can. So, about thirty years ago, my people uh, and CJ's people, academic historians, started saying, "Well, would you look at that? The parks actually were populated places." Well, what do you know? So. Uh, I'm, I'm making this sound goofy, but in fact, I had spoken and written about national parks without thinking who got displaced. I never did that. Then Mark Spence, I think it was 1999, Mark Spence's book, Dispossessing the Wilderness, uh, Louis Warren, Carl Jacoby, just, and, and I experienced that as someone turning on the lights. I had that, really? I'm, now, when I look back at that, I think, well, that doesn't, I mean, where would I have come up with this notion that somehow these parks had been uh, so lightly populated by human beings that there wasn't any displacement. So, so I'm going to, I do want to uh, do a little uh, curtsy in the direction of those academic historians who really did make us say, oops, we really, our attention drifted and we didn't get that. So, uh, so I remember those books coming out. I remember welcoming them and I remember thinking, okay, now what? I, I get how the histories have to be rewritten. I totally get that. Uh, I'm not sure I got there right away on uh, the, the Miwok people killed by the people, the white people who were so exultant about the beauty of nature as they came into Yosemite and then uh, showed the, the deepest ugliest, ugliness of human nature right at the same time, not two years later, but just right at the same time. So, so I'm, I'm, I struggle with that and I don't know why I wouldn't struggle with that. I don't know what exactly we're supposed to do when we bring uh, young children to parks. And if we say, and this is where several massacres occurred, and now you're seven years old, but we wanted to tell you about the seriousness of the history. So there are just all kinds of issues of public communication I'm, I'm not feeling like I'm breaking through on. And I'll just say that I'm really, really proud that my Senate of the American West does have an uh, ongoing, very committed project with Rocky Mountain National Park to make sure that visitors do have every opportunity to hear. So, and I think a number of the parks are taking that on and that is really good. But the question that David just makes us, I mean, it's great, we cannot avoid it when he's speaking to us and when we are hearing him, it's, are we trapped? Is this the, what we have to just say, well, it happened in the past, nothing much we can do about that. Uh, how much change is still possible? And as David says, 
remarkable things have happened in the way of changed jurisdictions and changed forms of, of governance and authority and restraint and uh, bad behavior and so on. So for reasons, I'm not totally sure how this has happened, but sitting next to my computer is a book that I read about three or four weeks ago, but I apparently won't put it back on the shelf because it is Bishop Tutu's and his daughter, Desmond Tutu and his daughter wrote a book called The Book of Forgiving. And the fourfold, fourfold path for healing ourselves and our world. So if we wanted to see a grim situation on the planet of the worst form of oppression and cruelty and brutality, I think we'd want to make a, the apartheid government of South Africa would be real high on our list of there's a place to look at the worst of it. And here is this man, Bishop Tutu, writing this book on forgiving. What that means isn't, as, as Bishop Tutu often said, it's not forgive and forget, it's forgive and remember. And then calculate what the remembering asks of the person who needs the forgiveness or the society or the group. And in some ways, the kindest thing to do to a perpetrator is to give the perpetrator a chance to be redeemed. Doesn't get any better than that. And what we've called rehabilitation in the country, no, we didn't, incarceration didn't turn out to provide that opportunity, but we do have restorative justice operations. We do have things that are that. So that's uh, where I wanna open us up to questions. I think I'm just going to look at my notes here and see if there's anything else that I will just feel terrible if I didn't get to. Uh, oh, okay, I do have one more thing I wanna say, which is one of the most, uh, one of the best, 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 best essays ever written in the United States was David's essay on the big drum ritual in the New York Times. <laughs> I mean, I'm gonna, I'll, I'm not, my voice will not remain steady when I speak of it because for various reasons, I've gotten very involved with student veterans on my campus. And my student veterans, veteran protégés have asked me to have them meet with Vietnam veterans, which I've done a couple of times now. So I've had uh, young folks from the global war on terrorism who served in Afghanistan and Iraq and Syria in conversation with people who served in Vietnam. And I'm, I haven't yet had those groups read your essay, but I, I, to some degree, I don't control the agenda with those folks. They, they're veterans to veterans and so on. But at some point that's gonna be a, a group discussion of these folks, because if you ever wanted to find people who had been put through the torments of the damned and not given much release from that, that uh, Vietnam soldiers who served on the front lines and in country and so on, they are those people. And David has this essay about a Ojibwe uh, ritual that has been always carried power and may have even more power than before in that. So Bishop Tutu and David's essay, they will save us together. We're going to have <laughs> David, he has passed away, but his daughter is still alive and we can have her join in the conversation. So I'm, I'm sort of in my manner, I'm uh, acting as if I'm saying something funny, but I'm not, I'm just saying this happens on the planet that terrible things, terrible acts are committed and people find ways to say, this is what happened and this is what we must face. And redemption is a part of that. Uh, I conclude these remarks just by saying that we don't really know the, the people who say, uh, David, can you make that happen? Is that something practical? Would that happen? And it is true that uh, the, the extraordinary fact that uh, many non-Indian people have struggled with is that Indian people are human. And sometimes they have spectacular government, government systems and, and spectacular public servants leading the tribe. And sometimes they don't. So, and that is because they are human beings. And that is the core of that mystery. So, so to say, oh, here is a group of people who are certain to do better than, than any other group of people, no. But to say, well, hmm, some percentage, all or nothing is a foolish way to, to hope for things. So either 100% or no percent is really. Uh, and there are co-management um, experiments underway. So that's not like, well, nobody ever thought that Nez Perce Folks, there's, there's stuff like that. So at the very least, scale it up, even if that means starting, starting small. And now I'm gonna say something on behalf of um, my people, which is to say white people, that 
when I've, okay, I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna say this, but it's so clumsy and so awkward that I guess, okay. So there is nothing that makes a certain kind of white person happier than being well received by an American Indian person. And you can see that going back three or 400 years, you can see that in the narratives of some of the explorers who were greeted warmly by a tribal group and they are just, oh, wow, they invited us to dinner. And it's, so there is a, a strong tradition of white folks yearning to be in better standing. So that's probably what I was most uh, struck by in your suggestion that this is, I'll give the, give the parks back to Indian people. And you say, keep the access to everybody. So that means, I don't know what the percentage is, but I'm going to 40, 2% of non-Indian people know that they would really like that, to be welcomed by Indian people. Whether that is good for their souls, <laughs> I don't know, I don't know. But there's just something, and I, I think there are many more, I'd go to 68% would, uh, we'd get up to that if we added the people who didn't know how much they wanted that, but then got a chance to realize that they really did like that. They really did like being invited in and welcomed and so on. So, so that's what I just thought was the most amazing part of the whole idea was that it wouldn't be give it back and make sure that nobody else intrudes. It would be keep it open, keep it open uh, and ask for good behavior and, and have some kind of restraints when that isn't lived up to. But anyway, it is really, it's quite a thing to see. And it, it does, uh, and I'm gonna be ending with the always open for new disputes and understandings. Uh, Abraham Lincoln, that Abraham Lincoln, as the nation divided, uh, the start of the Civil War, he, that's when he, he took the opportunity to say that he, he hoped that the better angels of the American people would come, would come out. So as much as some of the people writing uh, harsh and witless things to you, David, uh, don't seem to be quite in this group, the better angels were having a little trouble getting a grip on those people. But I think there is a, this is where I guess I do just stand convicted of is it optimism or is it just a sense that there are there is such a thing in human character that goes under that term better angels and in a very unexpected and, and extraordinary way your proposal invites those angels to come out and go on a hike thank you so so if i i'm going to assert my prerogative here as, as moderator and then we can open it up to the to the chat but one of the things that i since I've been so influenced by both of your both of your writing and both of your thinking, and I, at, at, and I, so I guess I'm biased when I say that I just completely agree with everything you say, just because I, you know, the part that's taught me how to think about these issues to begin with. But so I believe in, in what you said, David, about the current of violence underneath American history, and I, and I believe, uh, you know, your argument that you've been making for a very long time, Patty, about the nature of conquest as definitive. Of, uh, of American society. And I think that um, I think that one of the one of the social phenomena that that translates into is a very difficult relationship Americans have with land and territory, just the meaning of land and territory. And so so I think that part of what is so satisfying to me, David, about your argument about giving the parks back to the to the tribes is that there is this symbolic value precisely because the, the parks have this symbolic value in American society. It's like that that feels like justice. Um, but when I when I take a few steps back and think about the 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 even more complicated relationship with land that Patty was alluding to in the in the establishment of public lands. And as I did a bit of homework in preparation for this, I think that if, if we think about the, 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 the saying of national parks being America's best idea, which obviously I don't think we're, <laughs> I, don't, I don't think we buy, I think that maybe the Bureau of Land Management might be America's weirdest idea or, or America's like least understood idea. But, but to put this in context, the national parks, manage 
3.5% of American territory, like you pointed out, David, the BLM manages almost 11% of the United States of America. And then you add the Forest Service on top of that, 8.5%, Fish and Wildlife Service, 3.9%. What we find is that the total, the, the, the total land that falls under the purview of the Department of the Interior and like all these different agencies is absolutely astonishingly large. And in, in many ways, I think that the, the, the pushback that you've experienced, David, about, uh, 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 about the argument that you make is precisely because there's, there's a part of what's built into the establishment of the national parks is we want these pristine places and then we can basically trash everything else, right? We can keep we can keep urban sprawl. We can keep you know extractivism in all of its forms. And so those are the those are the those are the remains. And certainly, you know that's the case. You know, I mean the the joke, as all the Westerners will know, the BLM stands for the Bureau of Livestock and Mining, not the Bureau of Land Management. Um, and so, and in fact, since the 1990s, there had public lands have actually shrunk by 31 million acres, mostly in the context of quote unquote land disposals in Alaska and shrinking of DOD property. So my point here is just to say, yes, there, 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 is, there are all kinds of precedents for land transfer you know, between, between, um, uh, between different agencies. And so I wanna hear both of your thoughts about the, the role of symbolism in, in the argument that you're making David, in this larger context, because it, it couldn't be easier. I, I agree with you. If you actually wanted to do this, we could. Um, but also of the, the role that the national parks have in this much broader conversation about public lands that in, at least in the Eastern part of the United States, people aren't really even having at all. It's not even a conversation about public mm -hmm. lands. I know one of the biggest challenges here in Texas, you know, teaching my students here is they have no idea what I'm talking about. Because Texas was completely privatized, you know, by the end of the um, by the end of the 19th century, and so so I think that to join these to join these threats, like the this this history of violence and this history of con conquest, like my my hope and suggestion would be a much broader conversation about public lands, not just the national park. So so what do you what do you both think about that? Yeah, like um, there's a former senator and Chief Justice and the chairman of the um, Truth and Reconciliation Commission in Canada, his name is Murray Sinclair. And he said something to the effect of, he's, he's a native from Manitoba, he's Ojibwe like me. And uh, Murray said something to the effect of, we made treaties with the government in order to find a way to live together. And the Canadian government made treaties with us in order to not live with us at all. And I think that that's, that's true too in the United States. Um, and so when I think of symbolic gestures, right? I think about reversing that politically, sentimentally, symbolically. And so it's one thing to be lucky enough to get a permit to be able to go in to Yosemite and to stand in that valley and look up at those rocks and feel like you're in the presence of the divine, right? That's one thing, but wouldn't it be a much greater thing? Wouldn't it be a much more important thing to hypothetically get a permit from native people to go and have the chance to stand in that valley and know the only reason why you're allowed to stand there is because this country did the right thing. That you're standing um, not just in a valley, but you're standing from a place of justice, a place of compassion and trust. And that's that's what gives you the opportunity to look up at those rocks above you. It would be a very different experience to know that you're standing in a place, you know, that is sort of your, your ability to stand there is the result of a process of justice, of healing, 
of compensation, you know? Um, because the thing is, is that we tend to think when we're standing in wild lands or, or so-called empty spaces, we think we're only standing um, on the physical grounds, but we're always, no matter where we're standing, standing on social ground as well, you know? And it's kind of like what Camus said um, in a different context. He said something, and this used to hang over the toilet in my house when I was a kid, the poster um, that my Jewish Holocaust surviving father gave my Native American mother when she graduated from law school. And the poster was a, was a print of a Camus quote, which said, I should, still, I should like to be able to love my country and still love justice. Yeah. And so, you know, as I urinated as a child, I, I thought of that all the time. And uh, it really did hang in the bathroom. And so wouldn't it be able to, wouldn't it be important to be able to stand in a place like Yosemite or Yellowstone or Glacier or Voyagers or wherever? And to know that you're standing in a place of remarkable beauty, you know, and you're, you're able to stand there because your country chose justice. Yeah. It's a very different experience. That was uh, really well done. And make it happen. Let's just, <laughs> shall we? Uh, so, I'm going to reminisce uh, 25 years or so ago, 20 years ago, we were working on a project called the Handbook of the New West. And a graduate student and I went all around the West and we had forums. What should every Westerner know? We asked the local people and we went to, oh, we went all kinds of places. We went to Bend or we just went all over. And everywhere we went, we had nearly all white folks who loved where they lived and they had come to take part in our discussion. What should every Westerner know? And so the graduate student and I, uh, Julia, wonderful, talented young woman, Julia Hobson Haggerty, she and I would say, well, where should we start with that? What should every Westerner know uh, about your community, but about the West in general? And everywhere we went, the uh, white folks would say, we must remember the others who were here before us. And we are by no, and we're uh, settlers and descendants of settlers, and we must remember the people who are here before us. We must remember the Indian people. And so Julia and I, the first time or two, we thought, well, okay, that's a good place to start. Well, that's where that ended. And then we went to other things. I mean, we just went, went racing off on other subjects. And, and both Julia and I just, we got to sort of betting each other, will we ever go someplace where people say, I always started some version of that. We must remember that native people were here before us. Will we ever go someplace where the, nat where the Indian peoples are actually recognized as, and now because we recognize their earlier existence, we will do X or Y. We contribute, our community contributes to tribal colleges or our community does whatever. No, never. We never, <laughs> never heard that. So, but still we heard this ritual statement, we must remember. Mm -hmm. So to give people who are uh, non-Indian people who are having these good moments of saying we must remember to give them something to do and some meaningful way to say, well, now we've done it. Now we have recognized uh, it's not lip service anymore. It's something where we are saying, thank you so much for letting us come here to see this. This is so great. So that is really interesting to me because the, if we pushed on the, well, what would you think people should, do? people who are not Indians, what should they do? Just blank, 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 blank. Old Mother Hubbard, covered, very bare, nothing there. So it was just, well, goodness. So here's my weird idea is that, uh, oh, but, but actually I actually want to say also that the thing about the layeredness of history that you're standing on the surface is quite beautiful, but as soon as you begin asking any historical questions, all the things that are just beneath the surface in time are there. Hmm. And they're nowhere near as beautiful in many cases as that. So that, that way in which historians, uh, I'm very tempted to call out some really remarkable young historians who I'm working with in this encouraging uh, young people to repurpose their academic skills, attempted to mention them, but that's a lot of what they're doing is they're taking a place and they're going through different forms of human habitation and the transitions from one to the other. And it's really, it's very illuminating to see that. So that's important. Um, so I always th try to think about professions and practitioners who we are underutilizing because there are so many of them that don't seem to be having their souls uh, tested and rewarded as much as they could be. So I am thinking we are really messing up by not uh, seeking out probate attorneys. 
and spending lots of time with him because here are the people who deal with inheritances. They deal with, uh, here's the will that an older person has passed away and left things to family members. And sometimes the family members are getting exactly what they wanted and sometimes they're not. And so the probate attorneys have presented wills to descendants who have an inheritance that in theory, they could be pulling together because they got it from the past and it's written and there's there it is, they must take it in. So I'm assuming that the probate attorneys have sat and watched people who inherit something and could rise from that, but the probate attorneys have seen them turn on each other and say, our dad always, was so disappointed in you and why you got that now we don't know so anyway so i'm assuming that there is a huge uh, uh reservoir of wisdom in probate attorneys or maybe in family counselors or maybe that i don't know so but it seems like with the parks and with the vast amounts of land that are nowhere near as as celebrity rock star like in their standing as, as national parks but blm lands forest service lands uh what wildlife refuges and so on those are all an inheritance from a, from troubled ancestors really troubled ancestors so where are the probate attorneys to help us deal with this shouldn't they i don't know maybe they cost too much that might be why we're not doing it but it, it seems like we have a profession where people people look at heirs and try to figure out how to keep them from ruining each other's lives and actually keeping the property in as good a shape as possible. So I never thought about the lionizing of probate attorneys until <laughs> now. <laughs> and maybe I will never think of it again, but it seems like a pretty good idea. I, I also wanna like um, tell a short story about a couple of other reactions I've received to the, to the parks piece. Some guy living in the, mountains and hill country of North Carolina reached out to me, just some citizen, just some dude. And he said, I bought, I forget how much, 40, 80 acres, beautiful mountainside, North Carolina. And he said, I wanna give it back to the tribes that were here. And from my understanding, the tribes that were here were Cherokee. He's like, how would I do that? Mm -hmm. And I said, nothing could be simpler. You know, and, and how, how lovely and how encouraging and sort of how noble of you to want to do something. He says, I want to be able to live here until I'm no longer alive, but then I want it to go back to the people whose land it really was in the first place. And so there are lots of Native organizations around the country. Um, and I put them in touch with some from the Southeast who could figure out whose land that, that was. And what he's going to do is give himself, he's going to, put it in trust and deed it to that tribal group. And he's going to give himself a lifetime estate. And when he passes, it reverts to the tribe. That is easy. That is not more than a day's work, you know? And so it, it's a very nimble process. Um, it's done all the time, putting land in trust and then giving yourself a lifetime occupancy or estate on it, very simple. Um, there are lots of things we can do as individuals and as collectives, there's lots we can do. CJ, did you want to open it to questions or did you have? Questions? Yeah, so 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 I'm looking at the Q and A here, and we've got we've got a lot of we got a lot of stuff going on, and so what I'm going to try to do in the in the remaining minutes, so people out there, if you've got a question, write it in there. Uh, can't promise that we're going to get through it all, but I, I think if I had to synthesize a, a couple of different ones there, and this is something I think David that you've gotten before, and that is a lot of procedural questions. Yeah, right? how how would it work, Comed? Like, are, are the what about funding structure? What about the practicality of this? What about the, you know, what, what are other examples of co-managed lands? What other kinds of lands are, are co-managed? And like, and, and I, I know that quote from the PBS interview that Michael mm -hmm. referenced, I don't have to have plans. I just have to have ideas. <laughs> and I think that that's one of the strengths of this, but I, yeah. I wonder, I mean, either um, in terms of, I don't know, the way I read your article was that, that it was, Th that it was less about here's a here's a how to manual and, and mm -hmm. more about he here's a here's a great a big idea you know in, in the words of your of your editor one that makes sense but could you speak to the could you speak to the the policy practicality aspects of what you're proposing sure. um, and, and where that fits into your thinking I mean yeah I mean there's um I have a few reactions 
uh, to that. Like one of the questions was about co-management. There are lots of things that are already co-managed. So for instance, if you're in the Grand Canyon National Park and you want to, got, want to go to Havasupai Falls, you have to get a permit from the Havasupai tribe to get there. And they just spend, and they, they, they decide how many they will be issued and they decide who gets them. Um, there are lots of examples of co-management. I'm not really into co-management, you know? I think co-management is, is oftentimes, I mean, and I think that's a good example to have a soup by, but I think other than that, oftentimes co-management is just, um, it's pretend co-management. Yeah. You know? it's, it's window dressing or it's, it's, not, it's not substantive enough for me. So if all the parks were, I'm an all or nothing kind of guy, what can I say? But if the parks would be returned to native control, how would that be paid for? Well, I think the government should still have a line item budget for the National Park Service. I think all of the concessions and permits and fees, um, you know, would still devolve to this new entity, with however it was is organized. Um, and uh, yeah, why why wouldn't it still be uh, budgeted through the Department of Interior and you know it was approved by Congress and so on and so forth? Sure, okay, that'll work. Another option that I, I, I thought about, but it, it disappeared from the article um, because it clouded the central argument, which was land back. That was, the, that was the argument, but, and it clouded that argument. But one thing I thought about was, you know, as many of the people in this webinar may know or may not, um, the very first treaty signed between the United States government and a native tribe was the Treaty of Fort Pitt um, in Pennsylvania. And this treaty was, was done before this country was a country. It's while I was still fighting the Revolutionary War and the revolutionaries desperately needed Delaware tribal buy-in to protect the Western approaches to the colonies. They needed the Delaware to fight the British on the Western, on the Western border. And so that they wouldn't be fighting on multiple fronts at the same time. So they enticed the, the Delaware to the treaty table made all sorts of promises. And one of them, which was not quite a promise was that after the Revolutionary War, the Delaware tribe would be incorporated into the Union as the 14th state of the Union with full representation in Congress. So I thought, well, what if, what if we remember that treaty provision, which was never honored, and what if we expand it? What if the parks became essentially the 51st state, checkerboarded, dispersed holdings, by the way, like Native American tribes um, ever since the Dawes Act, have been dealing with widely scattered non-contiguous parcels and we've been administering to them for them for over 125 130 years so if anyone can do it we can um, but what if all of the national parks national monuments national historical sites were considered a non-contiguous 51st state with the judiciary with the legislature with an executive you know and the citizens of that state um, were all the tribal citizens in, in the United States. And we all voted, right? So, you know, the tax structure wouldn't we, would be very more, much more difficult, right? We wouldn't really have a tax base in the same way. Um, but that's one, that's one administrative structure I think would work really well. You represent it in Congress. Part of the problem with the Park Service, and this is just a Park Service problem, is that um, it's an agency which administers to all these lands. It's a similar problem with the BLM, with the BLM um, and some with fish and wildlife, that these are agencies and it's very, it's like not necessarily the best administrative structure for dealing with land. Um, statehood might be a better administrative structure, but you know, then again, I'm an ideas guy. I'm not a implementation guy. So, <laughs> you know, nor am I a historian just for the record. Well, you know, on that one, sorry, I just have to jump in there because you're going to be in a story. You are in a story. And I just I just made that happen because it's all hands on deck for history now. So to be <laughs> where we really include you in our group. No, we cannot afford that. And it was stupid anyway. It was uh, snobbish and stupid. So welcome aboard. <laughs> welcome aboard. All hands on deck. Uh, and the more of us, the better. And as if we're going to prevail, probably not. But but there's no snobbery that we can possibly engage in of saying we would like to see more credentials. So we're not going to do that. <laughs> and I, I believe I've written even a blurb or two to suggest that I support what you are doing in that manner. So I do have, I have one thing I wanted to say, cause it just kept uh, the co-management thing, the phrase African-American people, uh, 
well, I learned it there, but, and maybe, well, anyway, the phrase is that when blacks and whites cooperate, the white, the blacks do the coing and the whites do the operating. So, well, co-management, uh, it, it's, a, it's a known risk that the whites will do the operating. And so it's a known risk. So there is no reason to just go blindly into it. I guess that's what I was, I wanted to say about that. And I wanted to point out that you used the really in interesting word covenant uh, in your, in the article about what will exist there. Covenant is a really interesting word. And it's, it's got some, dare I say, it's got some hope in it. It's got some real, hmm. let's try one of those. It's not treaty. It's just, it's just a really interesting word. And then I would like to just speak on behalf of how we cannot foresee the future and astonishing things can happen. And this is my uh, brief, but really excellent little routine about if we were going to engage in a, in a uh, competitive, that we were going to bring a 19th century white pioneer into the present and we were going to compete to say what what were our competition it's, it's the competition is called astonish the immigrant and we are to get the thing that the pioneer would say really that happened i can't believe that that couldn't have happened so there are many ways you could do it of, of the internet i mean all kinds of stuff but telegraph a little bit like that so astonish the, the uh, pioneer winning entry in my opinion would be saying taking him taking the or her taking her to a uh federal courtroom where there is a case being tried on predator control. And you take your pioneer into the back of the room and you say to the pioneer over on that side of the room, those are attorneys. Those are people who have gone to law school and they are here representing coyotes. And the, the pioneer would go, that can't be. I mean, those, are, those are terrible uh, animals and we kill them because they eat livestock. And, these people went to law school in order to represent coyotes in court? That cannot be, take me back to the 19th century, I can't deal with it. So, so that is so improbable. If anyone in the 19th century had said, someday these predators are going to have some very well-trained attorneys who will appear for them in court, there would be, that is so, that cannot happen. So there are many other ways to do that, but just that, just because something seemed improbable, huh, that doesn't mean it's not going to happen. And then I do want to point out that I think it's Joyce Fry made a really important point in the comments about how I had just slid right over Abraham Lincoln and the Santee Sioux and the hanging of the mm -hmm. people there. So, the, so uh, I appreciate that. It's, it's still part of my cognitive um, exertions to say, well, that was an interesting man. And so... <laughs> Horrifying. Some of it was horrifying. And and yet he did try. He did seem to try to really reduce the number. Is that what is that? So anyway, but I'm really glad that that point is in there. And and I'm not doing very well in, in addressing it because I don't know how to address it. But I'm glad it, I'm glad it was brought up. So so we've got so I second Patty's um, induction data view into the into the guild of uh, historians. And, and I, I think that one of the things that we talk about all the time as historians is, is change over time. And, and we're getting um, and how we measure that and how, how we how we describe that. And I think that we're we're getting some we're getting some uh, some questions here in the chat that if I had to summarize it and hopefully not unfairly, um, are kind of are are, are are along the lines of uh, I don't I don't buy it. I'm not I, I don't think it it can be done, and I'm not convinced that native peoples um, have like a a, a, any different right than like than than everyone else, um, and so I think speaking to this question of change over time and speaking to the question of um, of uh, of things that were unthinkable in the past but now are thinkable, I think about our newest Secretary of the Interior, Deb Holland, who is Laguna. Those people in New Mexico obviously know know where that is. Thirty um, fifth generation New Mexican, as she as she describes herself. And, and if, if there's one cabinet level agency that, um, that if you asked 19th century native peoples, would you ever have someone who claims native ancestry as, as a presidential appointed member of that cabinet, that would be probably the last place to, that they would look. And so I wonder if you could talk about, uh, I wonder if you could both talk about the Department of the Interior and, and Deb Holland in particular. And, and again, going back to this, 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 relationship, this balance between symbolic importance and just presence and representation, and then actually concrete policy implementations, what difference it makes to have a, a Laguna person 
um, in that office. Um, I'll want to talk about um, Secretary Hallen second and respond to the uh, to the sentiment that you expressed first, um, voicing one of the questions that the people don't see where Native people have or should have different rights. Um, but just in point of fact, um, and just to sort of make sure the record's clear, we actually do have different rights. As citizens of sovereign nations, which happen to be inside of the United States, but distinct from it, we do have different rights. Those are treaty rights. Um, and so it's really hard for people to understand. It's especially hard for non-American folk and for, for like, you know, to understand that sort of, um, we aren't just an underserved racial category, you know, for whom, um, you know, the, the primary thing is civil rights. Although that it, those are still things that we are deeply concerned with and those things are, are true. But something in addition to that is that we are citizens of sovereign nations who have always been sovereign, who've been sovereign long before Westerners stepped on these shores. We do have different rights. Being native is a legal and political category, not just an ethnic or racial category. Um, and so, and we do have a right to ask for the return, the material return of native lands, if only a return to the lands promised us during the treaty making process, which according to America's founding documents, treaties are quote unquote, the supreme law of the land. So, you know, if we're just gonna sort of argue that lawyerly and narrowly, we could insist on the restoration of our lands and rights as outlined, even in the worst of the treaties that we were obliged to sign at certain points in time. That would mean that a lot of non-Native people would lose their homes, would get kicked out, would be forced to emigrate. But we're kind people, you know? We're generous people. We're forward-thinking people. So instead of kicking you guys out of your homes, I modestly suggest we work with the parks where very few of you actually live. That would work for me. I'm assuming it'll work for you. Anyway, as for Deb Haaland, um, I think it's great. You know, it's pretty cool. And, um, you know, people always ask me, not so much in relation to her, but they ask in relation to um, Sharice Davids from Kansas. I think she's Ho-Chunk. I could be getting this wrong. And I'm sorry if I'm getting this wrong. But they ask me, like, isn't this great news for Native people? The Native people, you know, isn't this great that she's, you know, Congress? I said, actually, it's good news for Kansans to be perfectly honest. Yeah. Americans in what the coastal folks call the flyover states are increasingly in the position that native people have been in for hundreds of years, right? In this age of the wealth gap, people in places like Kansas, Nebraska, North Dakota, South Dakota, New Mexico, Arizona, I could go on, are increasingly in the position that native people have been in for years. Lack of access to education, lack of access to capital, lack of access to healthcare, lack of access to economic opportunity. So who better to represent Kansans who are increasingly resembling native folk than a native person who understands huh. what it's like. And so I would say the same thing in Deb Hallen's case, who better to administer to the Department of the Interior, who better, you know, to look after the sort of the disenfranchised. In this case, it might be the very lands themselves that have been disenfranchised, not the people who live on them. Um, who better to mind them and direct their use and policy and support. So yeah, you know, good news. So I have just a couple of things I wanted to add on that. Uh, I, I did speak, I interviewed quite a number of the former secretaries of the interior. And out of that, I know that the Democrats are going to have the hardest time with, for instance, environmental groups, because the I know that the environmentalists will say, well, good heavens, look at that. Now we've got Bruce Babb, we've got Cecil Andrews, we've got a Democrat, it's really gonna be good. And then the disillusionment hits really hard. And 
Cecil Landers was in office for four years, as Secretary of the Interior, and his uh, some of his staff people told me that there were more lawsuits by environmentalists against Cecil Andrus than against Jim Watt, because there's this, oh no, he's one of us, and what is he doing now? Now he has all these different agencies. He has to balance them. He doesn't have to balance them. He can just toss out the, the USGS if he wants. I mean, <laughs> so it's really, it's a very silly uh, pattern of, of enthusiasts for particular causes, looking at the Secretary of the Interior, who they think will be their great, um, this is the person we've been waiting for and, he, and she or he's gonna do everything we've been hoping for. They can't, it's not a job that that permits that. They have to keep uh, doing, the, the Bureau of Reclamation is still, they still have dams, they still have all kinds of stuff. So it was fascinating to find out how quickly the Democrats office and how quickly environmentalist groups turned on them and were deeply disappointed and deeply disillusioned by them. So that is my fear with Deb Helen. I just think, oh no, don't do that to her. Don't do that. We're going to have ancient wisdom and it is going to, I mean, it's just, no, that's the Department of the Interior. If you've been to the Interior Building, you know that ancient wisdom has trouble taking hold there. And uh, Although really the best part of the interior building is the native crafts place, which has amazing belt buckles and things that are really great. And I hope they're properly priced and that the uh, crafts people are properly rewarded. But, but I just want to really say, uh, recognize that the ex excessive expectations of what a really cool person in that office is going to be, temper those uh, just for justice's sake and moderation's sake. And then I would like to point out a wonderful event of this week. Yay, best thing. Shelley Lowe, first Native American uh, chair of the National Endowment for the Humanities, sworn in Monday morning. Woohoo, woohoo. She is Navajo. She is, uh, I happen to serve on the council with her in case you think I'm in some kind of vicarious, well, I am in a state of vicarious joy over this. So there she was, uh, sworn in uh, on a Zoom meeting. And then the, we, we we just so insist that Jill and Joe bring her into the White House for dinner at some point and have an, have an in-person swearing in thing. So we don't know if that's going to happen. But that is huge to have Shelly as the first NEH chair. So we Interior has significance and power, but maybe if our dreams come true, maybe the National Endowment for the Humanities has greater power. And having this spectacular person as the chair, where might that go? But no exaggerated expectations and unfair <laughs> disappointment and disillusionment there either. So we won't do that anymore. So, woohoo, Shelly. Yay, Shelly. Everybody, we've uh, gone past the top of the hour. So, let me do a couple things. First, I want to thank our participants, um, David, Patty, and CJ, for doing a great job. Uh, and I apologize to some of the, of the audience whose questions won't be answered. But if some of you would like to continue the conversation at 3.30 Mountain Time, which is to say about 15 minutes from now, uh, you can contact Amy Schiffer, that's S-C-H-I-F-F-E-R at S-A-R-S-F dot org. She's our membership coordinator, and she... And, and unless the numbers get too big, um, she might be able to give you a link to the follow-up conversation, which, as I said, starts in 15 minutes. CJ will be riding herd on that. We'll get to hear from him. And Patty said she can join us. David has another commitment. So anyway, thanks to all of you. One final note, you know, David, you mentioned the America's violence problem. Uh, and on March 10th, the second event in this series will focus on aspects of America's violence problem. We'll have uh, an economist, a sociologist from the Brookings Institution, and an anthropologist from the University of Michigan to carry on that debate about the, uh, the astonishing upsurge in criminal violence in the United States after a long period of consistent declines in violence. So we're continuing some of these themes that won't really have a Native American component, but we'll talk more about urban, urban issues. So thanks to all of you. It's really been fun. And uh, Thanks to our audience for joining us. And this will be uploaded to YouTube probably within 24 to 48 hours. So it's available to the public free and at no cost. So thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone. <laughs>